This is a production of Cornell University. Hey, well, thank you so much, Fatek, for that, uh, that great introduction. And thank you for agreeing to let me um, come work with you. Um, I wish I could be there physically, but um, hopefully next semester. And um, really looking forward to, uh, to being there in person. Um, so yeah, uh, as Vitek said, I'm going to talk to you today about my work on um, spindle assembly in ZMAs. And as Vitek uh, alluded to, I, I, my background is in yeast. And when I showed up my postdoc, uh, Kelly said, here's a seed, here's soil, go for it. So that was sort of my um, introduction to plant biology. <laughs> and I, I am still in the process of coming to see myself as a, a plant person. Um, but in some ways, it makes it all the more exciting because there are these things that plants do that uh, just weren't sort of part of my psyche when I, when I first got into chromosomes and spindle assembly. So I'm going to tell you today um, a story about how ZMAs makes a lot of mistakes while it tries to build its spindles and how it accounts for some of those mistakes. And my computer froze, there we go. So uh, we all know that our genetic material is stored in structures called chromosomes. And we store these chromosomes in the nucleus of our cells. And I'm particularly interested in how chromosomes are segregated. How do we ensure that they are divided equally at cell division? So obviously we have our chromes located within cells and the important machinery here is the spindle. Um, the machinery is made up of a series of microtubules that forms this um, network that pulls chromosomes apart. So we've, you're probably all very familiar with this sort of classical picture of metaphase where spindles um, have been built and chromosomes are aligned at the equator. And after they've achieved this alignment on the equator of the spindle, they're ready to be split apart. And that's the movement into anaphase. And so this is a very important transition point in, um, the, uh, in any organism. This is the moment at which uh, you separate your chromosomes and there's no going back. Whatever you end up with in your new cell is what you're stuck with. So um, the process of segregating chromosomes on the spindle is similar, uh, very similar across many different organisms. The spindle itself, shown here in green in all of the pictures, can look very different depending on the organism. Everything from humans um, to sea urchins to maize all use a network of microtubules, but they can arrange this um, structure in very different ways. You can see the sea urchin spindle has a dramatic amount of astro microtubules facing away, um, whereas both human and maize have um, most of their microtubules um, in this football structure. Um, and all of them have their chromosomes aligned in the middle in metaphase. So again, as I mentioned, um, this process of building a spindle and attaching your chromosomes to it is, is critically important. Um, you hopefully will align your chromosomes and split them such that you end up with the proper number of chromosomes after anaphase. But sometimes this process goes wrong. Um, in this picture shown here, you have a chromosome attaching um, both sides of the chromosome, either both chromatids um, to one pole, or you can have other situations where chromosomes simply aren't attached at all. And so when you make mistakes um, in attaching your chromosomes, you end up with this situation of aneuploidy, where you have um, either missing or extra numbers of chromosomes in your cells. Um, in my graduate studies, I focused heavily on this attachment question about how chromosomes attach to the spindle through a structure called the kinetochore. Um, and then as I moved into my postdoc, I've become increasingly interested in the spindle itself. Um, you can have mistakes in how the spindle is assembled. So in this picture here, uh, we have a spindle that has, um, has too many poles. A correct spindle is bipolar. Um, and here in this image, we have a multipolar spindle, specifically a tripolar with three different poles. And in a situation like this, which is often common and commonly found in cancerous cells, you're going to pull chromosomes apart in a disorganized way and often lead to aneuploidy. So making these kinds of mistakes is very costly for an organism. If you do this process wrong in mitosis, which is most of the bodies, most of the cells in our body or in plants are mitotic cells, there can be severe consequences, but it can be even more severe in meiosis, the cell division that produces egg and sperm. Um, and so if we look at mitosis, you can think about if a mistake is made in a single cell in the body, um, it's a localized damage, that cell itself my, may have become um, aneuploid, which oftentimes induces apoptosis and the cell dies. But if the cell doesn't properly apop apoptose, this can lead to um, a tumor formation and ultimately cancer, which can spread throughout the body um, and obviously be very costly for the organism. 
but still I would argue fairly localized in its damage. Whereas meiosis, if you make a mistake in chromosome segregation in meiosis, you now have an error in the egg or the sperm, the gamete that's produced. So in terms of the parent, what this means is a reduction in fertility. But for the offspring, this can be completely lethal um, as the entire body of the organism, the entire um, all cells within this organism now carry that mistake of too many or too few chromosomes. And so actually um, uh, mistakes in chromosome seg segregation are the leading cause of infertility, miscarriage and birth defects um, <clears throat> in humans. So I would argue to you that meiosis is really the most important cell division that any sort of organism does, um, as this is going to directly uh, affect their own fertility and also the entire body structure of their offspring. So I'm particularly interested in how do cells get this process right, as shown in the picture above, where you properly pull your chromosomes apart, as opposed to the bottom panel, where you have chromosomes that are being pulled incorrectly or lagging behind on the spindle. So specifically, this um, results in two questions that I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, one, how is the spindle assembled? How is that machinery built in the first place? And then two, how are chromosomes segregated? Now, I'm going to focus on the first story in particular, um, as this is new work in my lab. But I'll also tell you briefly about what I learned um, in my postdoc answering that second question as well. And I don't work in humans uh, for many different ethical reasons, um, as well as just simply logistics. So instead, I focus in um, the important plant system, maize. And uh, meiosis occurs, obviously, in both the male and the female uh, parts of the plant. And my work specifically focuses on um, male meiosis, as these cells are easy to get to. Um, and we know that meiosis is critically important in plants as well, um, as infertility could cause um, an issue in terms of um, plant um, reproduction offspring. So maize uh, itself is clearly an, a very agronomically important plant. Um, meiosis is critical for breeding and also crop yield. So beyond um, questions of human health, these questions are equally important in plants. And Part of the reason I was really drawn to maize as a model system is the ability to collect so many um, meiotic cells. And this is particularly important in my lab where I work with undergraduates um, as these kinds of dissections and microsurgeries are, are more easily done in a plant system than in, in an animal system. Another great uh, benefit to maize is that we have um, a lot of genetic and genomic tools, including fluorescently labeled um, transgenic lines. And so this has allowed me to develop a live imaging system where we can image much in the way that um, animal systems have been imaged. We can image how spindles assemble and how chromosomes pull apart um, live and measure the dynamics of the process. And so one really exciting thing for me when I began my postdoc was that um, while there had been meiotic imaging in terms of chromosome dynamics and how chromosomes move, um, the spindles themselves had never been imaged in any plant in meiosis. Um, certainly, there's a lot of great mitotic imaging work done um, in various different parts of um, uh, mitotic tissues in a plant, but I was excited to look at meiotic spindles in particular. So um, how I do this is I harvest the tassel out of an immature maize plant, um, slice, open, slice open the plant, um, and remove the immature tassel. And on the tassel are florets. And inside of the florets are anthers, and this is where the male meiotic um, cells are located. So I dissect out the anther, I cut off the top, and then I very gently squeeze out the meiotic cells. You can see them, they're those little round gray balls that are oozing out. And once I've gotten them extruded from the anther, um, I pipette them up very gently and um, put them in onto a cover slide for imaging. So I'm going to show you now a series of movies um, that are focused on um, how the spindle assembles. So most of my movies begin in prophase one, and what you will see are um, green labeled microtubules. Specifically, it was a CFP uh, beta tubulin fusion, courtesy of Ann Sylvester and her group. Um, she and her collaborators made a series of fluorescently tagged um, maze lines that have been extremely helpful in my imaging system. And so I was able to use her beta tubulin fusion. So what you'll see in these movies are the nuclear envelopes still intact and microtubules um, uh, having sort of a hairy network structure around the nuclear envelope. That nuclear envelope is going to collapse and then in that uh, location a spindle is going to assemble 
here um, showing you the final metaphase spindle before it moves into actual pulling chromosomes apart in anaphase. I also have some meiosis two movies as well, where it looks very similar, except that meiosis one has uh, completed and built a cell wall between um, these two cells. And so now you have nuclear envelopes that collapse and assemble spindles in both halves of, um, of that cell space. And then later in my talk, um, I will tell you a little bit about chromosome segregation. And the only difference here now is that chromosomes are labeled and shown in pink. Um, they were particularly labeled with a uh, cyto-12 DNA stain and they, I've um, marked them as these uh, pink masses in my movies. So um, to the first question about how um, is the spindle assembled? So here is um, a movie that I wanna show you of two meiosis one cells. You can see in both of them, the nuclear envelope is intact and the microtubules are that sort of mesh network around them on the outside. And so if I play the movie, what you'll see is the nuclear envelope breaks down. All of the microtubule structure collapses into that space and a bipolar spindle is built out of it. I'll play that again. There's the collapse, the assembly of the bipolar spindle, and then actually here is the movement into anaphase, and then this structure appearing right here is the fragmoplast. And so um, we can collect movies both in meiosis one and meiosis two. So the cell on the right is a meiosis one cell, um, whereas the cell on the left is two different meiosis one cells with um, the cell wall that now separates them. And again, the process is very similar in breakdown of the nuclear envelope and then an assembly of this bipolar spindle that fills most of the cell volume. And in this movie, it didn't, um, I don't further proceed into anaphase. We stop here at these bipolar spindles. So um, what we've learned from gathering these images of uh, spindle assembly is that there are several steps in the process and we're, we've been measuring the dynamics of the process. So like I mentioned, what happens first is the nuclear envelope breaks down um, and all of the microtubules collapse into this uh, nuclear space. And so that process of nuclear envelope breakdown takes about eight minutes on average. And then going from this collapsed spindle, um, uh, sort of massive chromosomes into the bipolar structure. Um, what I show in this middle panel is what I would now call a bipolar spindle. And then in the last step, it sharpens the poles to be um, these very tight points, um, spindle focusing. So that whole process um, from collapse to bipolar takes about 29 minutes on average. If we look just at the spindle focusing component where it goes from that sort of more broad spindle, which actually is more similar to a mitotic maze spindle. Um, mitotic maze spindles do not have those sharp focus poles. So the focusing step um, takes about 16 minutes. And um, we know actually that step is very critical. Uh, there is a classical um, maze mutant called DV1 <clears throat> that um, lacks the kinesin to help do this focusing. Um, and so it's uh, spindle poles stay splayed like this. And we know that this, um, uh, this mutant has defects in chromosome segregation, and we actually have imaged this mutant live, and we can see how the chromosomes get pulled um, incorrectly without being um, transferred to a very specific spot by a focus pull. So if we look at the process in total from nuclear envelope breakdown to the collapse into that inner space, um, creation of the bipolar spindle, and then sharpening focusing of the poles, this whole process takes about 35 minutes um, from start to fully formed bipolar spindle. And what I found actually is that there are some differences in the dynamics between meiosis one and meiosis two. And so in particular, um, meiosis one seems to take a little longer. Um, it is statistically significant. It takes about seven more minutes on average than meiosis two. Um, so in yellow, you'll see, or orangish color, you'll see meios meiosis two distribution, where is in um, blue, you see meiosis one distribution. Um, and so there, is, there does seem to be this shift in terms of um, the distribution of time it takes meiosis one uh, spindles to assemble. So um, what we know about meiosis one versus two, uh, looking through all of the videos here, is that the breakdown process of the envelope does not appear to be any different. Uh, there's no timing, no difference in timing. Um, no, it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any structural differences. And so the difference comes from the actual um, spindle assembly component it's part itself, that moment of collapse um, to full, full assembly. And so here's the, here's the um, distribution plot 
of uh, just that sort of middle part of the process from collapse to bipolar spindle. And um, again, if we look at the averages here, um, meiosis one averages about 31 minutes, whereas meiosis two averages about 25 minutes. And again, this is statistically significant. The, um, the focusing on the poles as well doesn't seem to show any difference in terms of the timing or process. Um, so all the difference lies in this um, actual assembly um, of the microtubules into the correct bipolar form. So um, I started thinking about this a bit and I, I'm curious why that process is slower in meiosis one. Um, my first thought was, you know, are meiosis two spindles smaller? Um, or, you know, as measured by a proxy of length. Um, what we know is that the spindle length is the same. There's no statistical difference in terms of its length. In terms of chromosome content, we know at this point that homologous chromosomes have been separated, but sister chromatids are still paired. So in that sense, there are still the same number of connection points to the spindle. So in theory, there would be just as many um, kinetochore microtubules attaching, but that's certainly something I'm interested in looking at, into in terms of the content of microtubules in these spindles. Are there, are there um, you know, less uh, required components to build at this point? One area that I'm interested as well in following up in is, is the difference due to cellular volume. So as you can see from just this picture right here, um, meiosis two cells are much smaller. They're about on average half the volume. So I'm gonna do a closer measurement of cell volume in these and um, look to see if there's a correlation between cell volume and um, assembly time, because there is a little bit of variation in terms of size um, of meiosis one and meiosis two cells. So my idea or thought is that perhaps in this smaller volume, um, you get a higher concentration of components. Um, there's simply a higher concentration of things that assemble the spindle, the tubulin components of them themselves. And so there's less space in which for them to um, need to find one another to assemble the spindle. Um, now, if you're watching closely in my movies here, what you might have seen is this time point right here, which I was saying is the collapsed point at where the um, nuclear envelope has fully broken down and the microtubules exist now in that space that was the nuclear, um, the nucleus. And actually, if I add in another time point for you here, I wasn't showing this one before, um, but what you see is actually a tripolar spindle. So um, later on, we ultimately do achieve a bipolar spindle, but during the process of building the spindle, um, it is uh, tripolar for a period of time. Um, and so in order to uh, correctly pull chromosomes apart, as I mentioned before, that needs to be corrected. If we went through anaphase at this point with three pulls, you would get chromosomes being pulled unequally um, and not um, allowing chromosomes to be separated into two volumes. And like I said, that can obviously result in aneuploidy. Um, and like I said, correction did occur in this particular cell. It did go from tripolar to bipolar. Um, also in that first movie I showed you, there was another instance of a tripolar, um, the top cell here, um, which you can see in panel E. Um, again, the movies I collect here, I'm collecting data in three-dimensional space. And so what I've been showing you here are um, Z-dimensional collapses. But if you do look through all layers of the planes, you can see more sharply, more, more focused that there are three poles. Um, so in panel E is probably E, D or E are probably the best representation of that. And then moving from panel E to F, there is this correction into a bipolar spindle. Um, this is one movie in particular where I thought the uh, correction was very pronounced. So I'd like to show you this one. Um, a spindle has formed tripolar designated here with the white arrows. And if we watch that tripolar shape has to collapse two of the poles and then ultimately end up bipolar. So let's play that again for you. So you can see that these two bottom poles collapse into one and fold up together. So um, by analyzing all of our data, what we have found is actually the majority of the time cells initiate um, an incorrect number of poles on their spindles. So actually tripolar is the most common spindle structure. So what I mean by initiating correctly is that upon breakdown of the nuclear envelope, the first structure that forms is actually tripolar um, most of the time and then has to correct into a bipolar form 
And so if we add together all of the different incorrect forms, so in addition to tripolar, we also sometimes find these multipolar spindles where there are four or more poles. Um, and sometimes the, the, it simply is too chaotic to really assign. Um, so we call that unorganized where there just seem to be um, uh, uh, too much uh, lack of organization to initially see either a bipolar or a, um, some sort of other multipolar spindle. So if we add together our tripolar, multipolar, and unorganized spindles, um, that gives us 61% of the time spindles actually form incorrectly and then need to actively correct into bipolar. And what we found is that 63% um, of the time, um, those incorrectly formed spindles do correct. So it's certainly not anywhere near 100%, um, but the majority do correct and move on without consequence. For uh, cells that, that do correct, that correction time takes about 10 to 15 minutes um, before they proceed to anaphase. And so as you can imagine, um, if you've built a spindle incorrectly and then you need to take that um, additional 10 to 15 minutes to correct it, um, the full assembly process in these cells that initiate incorrectly is longer on average. So if you initiate incorrectly, um, it takes an additional seven minutes or so to get all the way to a correct spindle. Um, one thing you may notice here is that that sort of seven minute average there doesn't equate to the 10 to 15 minutes I just said. So there does seem to be, um, I'm still quantifying, but um, in cells that initiate correctly, once they reach a correct metaphase um, spindle, there is a period of wait um, or hold time before you move from metaphase to anaphase. And what it seems to be um, is that in cells that initiate incorrectly, um, they sort of make up a little bit of time during that hold. So um, I think that they, they don't hold in metaphase quite as long. They correct into a bipolar spindle and move a little more quickly into anaphase um, than cells that initiated correctly. And the um, spindle correction time is also um, dependent on the type of meiosis, meiosis one versus two. Um, so what I found is that meiosis two spindles correct faster than meiosis one cells. Um, and this also um, plays right along with the fact that it looked like meiosis two spindles build, um, assemble faster in general, like we said before. And again, that could be back to that, um, that same idea of a more constrained volume in which you're operating. So your, um, your regulatory components and your building blocks are more easily accessible perhaps. And if, when you look at this distribution plot here, um, you may be drawn to uh, this little plot out here that seems to be a dramatic outlier in terms of the amount of time it took this particular cell to correct. Um, everything else is fairly tightly distributed um, around this you know, 15 minute mark. And so we had this one cell that uh, it took 45 minutes to correct. So I was curious what was going on in that particular cell. Um, and what I found is actually in this particular cell, two completely bipolar spindles formed. Um, as you look through the panels here um, in this top uh, right hand panel, we have two fully formed bipolar spindles. And then starting in this bottom panel, they have to now merge themselves into a single bipolar spindle. And then in the last two panels, they go through anaphase. So this was really exciting um, because uh, coming from the animal world, there's been a lot of uh, in vitro studies of chromosome and spindle dynamics. Um, Rebecca Heal um, is an excellent chromosome spindle biologist who's um, had done a lot of imaging on um, chromosomes being sort of this hub for spindle assembly and how spindles will assemble around any chromosome mass. So should your masses of chromosomes be further apart, you can build separate independent spindles. Um, and all of her work had been done in vitro and obviously in an animal system. So I was really excited when we found this movie as it's sort of this real in vivo evidence this, that this ability um, ex does exist in cells to merge two totally independent spindles, um, correctly formed bipolar spindles that should be um, attaching their chromosomes correctly. It's able to recognize this and now merge the two spindles into a single one before moving into anaphase. So um, why so many mistakes? So one important point here is that plant spindles lack centrosomes or the organizing spindle uh, or the organizing center, the hub from which uh, microtubules can nucleate out. Um, animal mitotic cells have these kinds of organizing centers, but animal meiotic systems also lack centrosomes. So um, in these types of cells, 
um, all plant cells or female meiotic cells, and obviously certainly plant meiotic cells, um, you have to build a spindle without those organizing, um, discrete organizing centers. So these sorts of acentrosomal spindles, as we call them, um, have to regulate their own assembly through some sort of self-organization process. So in this top panel, you see those centrioles, those organizing centers that nucleate out microtubules and attach to chromosomes. Whereas in the bottom panel, acentrosomal spindles um, have this network, this hub of microtubules that are nucleating around chromosomes and then build out to a bipolar um, shape. So we're really interested in this process then. How is that acentrosomal process being regulated in our system? And we know that there are evidence for uh, multiple different pathways, the two primary ones being the RAN GTP pathway. So this is the process by which um, RAN, which is also involved in nuclear import, helps deposit um, uh, spindle assembly factors near chromosomes. And another system or another pathway called the CPC or chromosome passenger complex pathway, um, again, is a gradient that's focused near chromosomes, um, near their centromeres. Um, and the two main players in both of these, um, in the RAN GTP pathway, um, a series of proteins, but one that I'm particularly focused on, the RAN GAP protein, um, which helps convert RAN GDP to the GTP form in, our, in order to allow the deposition of these components. And then the CPC pathway is Aurora B. Um, and Aurora B has many different roles um, in spindle assembly and attachment of chromosomes. And so I'm particularly intrigued as this is sort of a new role that's been found for Aurora B in the initial assembly of the spindle itself, rather than just a, a correction or checking mechanism after the fact, after the spindle has been created. So um, we are following up in my lab by looking at these two different pathways. Um, so the images I'm going to show you here are actually um, uh, fixed immunostained images. Uh, so I apologize, my, my color scheme changes at this point. So we now have um, microtubules stained in red um, and chromosomes in blue here. So we've been working on um, inhibiting these potential pathways using drugs. So we are targeting Aurora B using hesperidin, which has been demonstrated to target specifically Aurora B um, in uh, mitotic plant cells as well as animal systems. And this inhibition does appear to be specific to Aurora B and other systems, so we feel fairly confident using this as um, a target or as a, um, a, um, as a small molecule inhibitor for Aurora B. We are also inhibiting RAN GTP using Importazon. And um, just some representative images um, here for you. There do seem to be some very striking uh, morphology defects here. You can see in Aurora B, we have a um, very distinct tripolar spindle. Um, and here on the right, we have what I would call sort of a disorganized spindle um, where we don't have distinct poles, but clearly this is an incorrect spindle. Um, over here in this picture of inhibition of RAN, we have um, poles that don't look fully focused and we don't have a nice congression of chromosomes on the equator. And another component that we're actually looking into are the kinesins involved in building the spindle. As I mentioned before, uh, DV1, um, which is a kinesin 14, um, is very involved in building the spindle. So we are using a particular inhibitor that um, affects EG, EG5 kinesin. And we were finding some very dramatic effects of knocking down that kinesin as well. So um, as you I'm sure know, you know, drug inhibition can have some off-target consequences and it's not quite as clean or direct. Um, as knockouts and knockdowns. So this was sort of our pilot study. Um, and now that we're getting some initial um, uh, promising phenotypes, we are currently creating some um, RNAi knockdown lines. Um, I hesitate to use CRISPR on these just because these components probably are um, essential. So we are creating RNAi lines to hopefully uh, drop expression level. So um, what, another interesting thing we've seen here too is that um, inhibiting particularly the RAN GTP pathway will lead to a block in cell cycle. Um, and so what this means is that it suggests that there is an active um, checkpoint that's making sure this process is going correctly. So if here's what um, the different parts of the cycle look like, we start off at prophase, condense our chromosomes in prometaphase, um, align them in metaphase, and then pull them apart in anaphase, telophase and cytokinesis. Um, I apologize, in these images, I don't have um, spindles marked, but those are chromosomes that you're seeing in white um, where they condense and align in metaphase and then pull apart in anaphase. When we look 
Um, in cells that have been treated particularly with importazole, we're still working on the hisperidin, the um, Aurora B treatments. But when we, um, not when we affect the RAN GTP pathway, um, what we see in red here, those are the cells that have been treated with um, uh, the RAN gap um, uh, small molecule, is we see an accumulation of cells in prometaphase, where normally under control situations, you have a fair number of cells in prophase, prophase and then they cycle quickly through prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase as they build their spindles and are able to proceed. Um, but in importazole, we get this large block of cells that are holding up prometaphase, most likely because they are unable to build their spindles and therefore not move forward in the process, which suggests there is an active spindle assembly, a checkpoint, something that is looking and making sure this process is working um, and saying, no, you're not ready to proceed. Um, uh, we also have here shown in blue taxol, which is a known microtubule depolymerizer and sort of our control in this, in this situation. So one thing that I'm interested in following up on um, is a um, looking more closely at this spindle assembly checkpoint. Um, so MAD2 is a protein that is one of the critical components of the spindle checkpoint. Um, so I believe MAD2 is important in this process here in terms of monitoring the assembly of the spindle and then the passage allowing it to move forward into the metaphase to anaphase transition. Um, and so what you see in these two panels down here in B and D is MAD2 is uh, labeled in red. And um, in Kelly Dawes lab back in 1999, they identified maize MAD2, and they showed that it does um, localize on kinetochores, on that attachment point of chromosomes to the spindle. It localizes there when things um, are not correct. And then once you build a correct spindle, um, you can see in that panel D there, uh, the signal goes away. It's no longer localizing, um, which suggests now that the spindle checkpoint is satisfied and is going to allow cells to progress. So um, that's part of what I'd like to do in Votex lab is um, thanks to um, uh, members of his lab, Kasha in particular, is making a Matthew M. Cherry um, transgenic line for me in maize. And um, when I can come to campus, I'd like to do some live, uh, live imaging of MAD2 on the kinetochores during this whole spindle assembly process and um, study the dynamics of um, how is it reacting to these kinds of mistakes? And is it, um, is it localizing on those kinetochores when there are mistakes and then disappearing when it's resolved? These images here in B and D are all fixed images. And I think we need a finer level of detail and to look at the dynamic process to really understand what's happening. Um, so thanks so much to the Pawlowski Lab for hosting me and I can't wait to get there in person. So um, with just the last little bit, I'm gonna tell you very briefly about the second part of this process. Once you've built your spindle and corrected it and hopefully is now bipolar, um, how do you actually pull chromosomes apart? And this is a story um, that I worked on in my postdoc, but I wanna tell you about just one brief um, interesting thing that came out of it. So um, in these particular movies, um, I, again, microtubules are labeled in green, but now you'll be able to see chromosomes, which are labeled pink uh, due to a cyto-12 DNA stain. And again, you have meiosis one and meiosis two cells. So um, meiosis one here on the left, we are starting with a metaphase spindle. Um, so the spindle has been built correctly into a bipolar shape and chromosomes are aligned on the equator. And there you see the chromosomes pulling apart in anaphase, the spindle breaking down. Oop, let's get that to play again. There we go. Um, and that is the phragmoplast then that is appearing afterwards. There it is right there. Um, likewise, in meiosis two, we have the two spindles side by side in the resulting cells for meiosis one. And similarly, they pull apart in that metaphase to anaphase transition and then build a phragmoplast um, out of the microtubule remnants in the center of the cell. So in these studies, what we did was we honed in particularly on the chromosomes um, and tracked their motion on the spindle. So what you see here are just uh, chromosomes. Uh, the spindle is no longer in this image. And um, what will happen is this mass of chromosomes in the middle is going to be pulled apart. And what we did um, was track the movement of that chromosome mass during anaphase to um, investigate the dynamics. So again, just backing up, you'll see a blue line appearing. Um, that is our tracking in three-dimensional space of the chromosome mass. And there it goes. <laughs> 
So, um, like I said, we had our um, system that we were looking at in three dimensions and we could hone in on that chromosome and track it as it moved through all the frames of the movie and specifically, again, focusing just on the chromosomes in this question um, and how they moved. <clears throat> and this allowed us, um, as I said, to track them in three dimensional space and look at things like how far do they move? How fast do they move? Where within the cell are they positioned? And how often do they make mistakes? And so what we found was that actually, surprisingly, they made very few mistakes. So um, most of the time, uh, the very dramatic most of the time, um, there was a very uniform anaphase in terms of the pulling apart of chromosomes. There was a few instances of slow moving chromosomes um, where chromosomes are lagging behind the main mass, which you can see in this panel <clears throat> on the bottom. But eventually that was resolved and the slow moving chromosomes did catch up with the rest of the mass. Um, we had very few instances of lagging chromosomes, um, which I defined as chromosomes that um, stayed behind on the anaphase bridge. They lagged behind and they never fully caught up with the main mass of chromosomes, as you can see in this last panel. They continue to sort of be stretched out um, and never fully um, resolved. But one particular thing really popped out at us as we were watching these movies. Um, in most, if not all, anaphase, um, you see a very symmetric division of chromosomes on the spindle. When I say most, if not all, I mean other systems. Um, a lot of different movies of metaphase to anaphase transition, you can watch in many different species and many different cell types. Um, and there are only a few exceptions to this example, but we found something very, very dramatic. Um, in many, many of our cells, we actually saw um, what we called asymmetric movement of chromosomes on the spindle. So if this is a symmetric movement where the chromosomes line up at the equator, they pull apart equal distances away from that equator. Um, and we know that that movement is powered by uh, forces generated within the spindle that apply equally on both masses of chromosomes. So we saw this very dramatic asymmetric movement where one side, one mass of the chromosomes moved much further on the spindle than the other mass of chromosomes. And this is very, very odd. Um, it actually never been seen before in this type of um, meiotic system. And the only example I could find were um, some very specific cases where um, there are other components involved and usually some sort of trauma or incident um, involved that causes this kind of movement. And the interesting thing about all of my movies that I've shown you here today is these are all wild type dynamics. These are things that we didn't really realize cells were doing because we had never taken that fine of a look. And so um, down in this bottom panel, you can see an example of this asymmetric movement. So I've marked the chromosome uh, movement paths in two different colors. Um, in the bottom, you'll see one mass of chromosomes with a blue line. Uh, that is a mass of chromosomes that move very far on the spindle. And the other mass of chromosomes marked with that little orange trail that's the, dis that's the um, path that this other mass of chromosomes took, and it's um, significantly shorter than the other mass. So if we measure these chromosome movements, um, and in my scheme here, you will see the mass of chromosomes that move further is labeled in blue, so I call that mass A. Um, the mass of chromosomes that move not as far in the spindle as mass B, shown in orange, um, and it is statistically significant over time. Um, these chromosomes do move much further on the spindle than B. So it's not just um, in a few cells and it's not just something temporary. It is a movement that is then sustained. Um, I won't show you the data today, but they are actually moving faster as well on the spindle. So they both reached their final desti destinations at about the same time because A is moving much faster than B. And so we were very curious about um, what is causing this asymmetry of movement. Um, uh, and even to this day, we're still very curious about um, how in terms of force generation, this is able to, to happen. So uh, one of the questions we asked was um, perhaps what's happening is that the chromosomes, um, this is happening in cells where the chromosomes are not exactly lined up on the equator. Perhaps the mass of chromosomes are offset a little bit so in movies where there are asymmetric divisions, perhaps the chromosomes are off, offset from the center of the spindle and we can measure that offset um, denoted here as um, delta chromosome spindle. So an offset distance from, from the equator. So we looked in cells that were very symmetric in their division and cells that were very asymmetric in their division. And what we found really is that there was no difference in terms of the chromosome location on the spindle. So no, there was no offset of chromosomes on the equator to explain this kind of movement. 
And next, what we looked at was um, placement of the spindle within the cell itself. Um, the cell, you can imagine, we are going to do a division here to create um, two cells, and we would like that to be a very equal division, such that the two resulting cells end up with equal um, cellular volume, because we're going to go then into meiosis two, and again, we'd want to have an equal distribution of uh, cell volume. So perhaps what's going on here is that maybe the spindle is offset from where you would want it. You would, would, you would want the spindle in the middle of the cell so that you pull your chromosomes into equal volumes and then build your um, new cell wall in the middle. <clears throat> and indeed, what, what we did is we looked at the symmetric and asymmetric divisions. And in these cases, um, the spindles were more offset, closer to um, the edge of the cell in the asymmetric, asymmetric divisions. And I don't have time to show you all the data today, but what we found is that the mass of chromosomes, chromosome mass A that moves much further on the spindle is moving into the larger cell volume. So um, yes, it does seem to be that chromosomes are um, moving more on the side of the spindle that needs to go further to get into an equal cell volume. And the last kind of interesting thing that I want to show you here, um, something that kind of caught our attention was, I don't have very many movies of these, but um, every once in a while, I will see an instance where uh, the spindle fails completely and is not able to pull chromosomes apart. And I'll just show you what happens here in this one particular cell <clears throat> where we have um, built a spindle, chromosomes are lined up in the middle in metaphase, and here's what happens. So what you see is their chromosomes are lined up in metaphase, but the spindle fails. And so the chromosomes just start floating away. But then the cell initiates uh, formation of the fragment plast, even despite this issue. And in these um, middle panes here, you can see the fragment plast starting to form here. And it actually, actually displaces and pushes the chromosomes out of the way and separates them into the two masses. So I found this very intriguing. Certainly this would be a very bad way to segregate your chromosomes as there's no um, directing which chromosomes go which way, but it is curious and intriguing to see if this could perhaps be sort of a last dish, ditch effort. If all else fails, is this your sort of last chance to at least separate your chromosomes in some mechanism such that perhaps you still have a chance at fertility? So um, just to recap what I've told you guys about today, um, what we see while watching wild type uh, maze meiosis is that there are a lot of mistakes in this process. Um, the, the process of assembling a spindle is very error prone. Um, in many of the cases, spindles initiate a tripolar spindle that has to be corrected before cells can move into anaphase. Otherwise, they will have this missegregation event of their chromosomes. Um, and we're investigating now sort of the acentrosomal pathways that regulate that spindle assembly. Now that we've got a handle on the dynamics, um, we'd like to track down now the um, pathways important for that. And we do have some very good evidence of two or three different pathways involved in this process. Um, and also I'm looking at the role then of the checkpoint as well. What is the checking mechanism that not only makes sure that um, spindle is formed and chromosomes are correctly on the spindle, um, but also the whole process is um, going correctly. And I have some preliminary evidence that um, MAD2, that protein that I'm interested in studying, is involved in the initial building of the spindle as well, not just a final checkpoint. Um, and then in the last part of the story, I told you about this strange asymmetric movement of chromosomes that we observed. Um, this seems to be a corrective mechanism, um, a way to get your chromosomes into equal volume. So the spindle will pull chromosomes further on the side that needs to travel further in cell volume in order to uh, place these masses equally within the cell volume. And then lastly, I, um, this kind of interesting idea of the fragmoplast perhaps as a mechanism of separating your chromosomes and certainly not a good choice on how to separate your chromosomes. Um, but if all else fails, is, is this at least a way to um, separate them and allow you to move forward in the cell cycle into meiosis two and beyond? So with that, I just wanna say thank you to everybody that's been involved in this project, um, particularly my students at Hamilton. Like Botek said, I've been here uh, three years. This is now my fourth year. Um, <clears throat> they've had a bunch of excellent students that have um, I uh, collected this data and analyzed this data. One student in particular, Jody, here with her uh, maize plant, um, 
She did a lot of the analysis in this work. Um, current students in my lab, particularly Shelby McVeigh, um, has done a lot of the work on this project. Um, and then I'd like to say thank you to Votech and um, also Kasha for making my uh, Mad 2M Cherry Line and the whole lab for letting me join in on your, your Zoom meetings. And hopefully I will get to meet you all in person next semester. And also thank you to Kelly, um, my postdoc advisor, who I continue to collaborate with, as well as the National Science Foundation for funding much of this work. And with that, I'd turn it over to questions. Thank you, Natalie. That was very informative. Any questions? I'd like to so, ask a question. Of um, I was curious that the number of tripolar spindles was it's, at the onset was greater than the number of bipolar spindles. Yeah. And I wonder if it has anything to do with the um, technique you use to get beautiful movies. I mean, unbelievably beautiful mm -hmm. movies. Mm -hmm. But um, do you see as many if people that have done sectioning of anchors, do they see the proportion of bipolar, tripolar spindles that you've seen? Yeah, that's a it's a really good question. Um, and certainly, uh, when we were writing up our, our first story, well, and actually the second story I, I told today about the asymmetric movement of chromosomes on the spindle, that was a major concern of our reviewers was, you know, is something about the treatment of the cells causing this kind of movement. Um, and so we looked at our movies and, um, you know, one of our concerns was like, simply, are we squishing the cells? Are we compressing them or damaging them in some way that's causing these kinds of phenotypes? Um, and so we've modeled the cell volume and it doesn't seem to be compressed in any way. Um, certainly there is always a question about, um, you know, removing from them from the context of their, um, their tissue, have we done something? Um, it is hard to compare this to fixed data because that moment in time where it's tripolar to bipolar is about 10 minutes. And so um, I've done a lot of fixed work, but it's very hard to catch them in that 10 minute time to see, um, are there a large proportion of tripolar spindles? And certainly there are many mutants out there that have um, a, a predominance of tripolar spindles. And um, that could be an instance perhaps then that shows yes, tripolar spindles do happen at a pretty high frequency. And these mutants then are clearly involved in that um, corrective pathway. Um, so that's actually something I wanna follow up on the future is now moving this live imaging system into um, uh, those mutant backgrounds. Um, <clears throat> but um, we, you know, we don't think that we are creating that, that tripolar um, phenotype with our system, but that's actually another thing that I'd like to do with Votex group as well. Um, with the multi-photon imaging, we can stay inside of the anther and we don't have to do the extruding process of the myotic cells out. Um, my setup doesn't have as, the ability to go quite so deep into tissue, so I have to um, get the cells out of their anther context. But I would be very curious to look at that and to, to confirm that um, this is not something that we're inducing with our methods, although we seem to have evidence that suggests that's not the case. And, um, that would be a beautiful way to test that. Can, can you tell us um, a little bit how you prepare, um, how you put the cells on the cover slips? And Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> So I extrude them from their, um, isolate the anthers, cut off the ends, extrude them out. Um, and then I pipette them onto a cover slide with sufficient um, uh, liquid volume that the cells are not compressed. There is about um, 80 to 100 micron spacing between my cover slip and the slide. Whereas um, the myotic cells themselves are about um, 40, 45 microns in diameter. So um, the distance from the cover slip to the slide is a larger volume in which the uh, cells have to exist. And I also affix them to the cover slip to assist with imaging um, using um, uh, polylysine so that they don't float away on me. Um, and I let them sort of send, settle gently out of the cover slip. And then in my movie, I did it really fast, but then put them onto the slide for imaging. Um, and I take Z slices, um, I'm trying to remember what my steps were. I think my steps were, 10 micron steps. Um, so I can get the whole cell volume um, and make sure that I have not like compressed it, that it's still a round, um, um, round cell volume. It's a round cell volume. Um, yep. Taking into consideration the difference in the axial resolution. Of the yeah, I actually have volume. movies. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so um, you, you must not see a round cell volume. So um, 
you're right. So resolution in Z is obviously much worse. Um, uh, so I do have movies where my spindle is oriented through the Z plane. Um, and so I actually tend to focus my analyses where I have um, uh, it laying in, in um, X, Y rather than in Z. Um, because it's, uh, yeah, the resolution is just nearly not as good. The images are not nearly as sharp. So um, you can you can find spindles oriented this way in terms of my imaging. Well, thanks. It's beautiful, beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you. And Natalie, you have a question in the chat. Oh, great. Which I can read if you have problems. Um, it says, let's see, is there any functional significance to the spindle focus shape difference between meiosis and mitosis? Um, yeah, great question. Um, is there variation in mitotic spindle morphology among cell types? Um, yeah, so that is actually something I'm really interested in. Um, so like I said, the maize mitotic spindle is more of a barrel shape. Um, it does not have nice focus poles. Uh, I've been curious since I first joined Kelly's lab about why that is. And, um, you know, I don't have a good answer to that right now. Um, I think that, you know, there are clearly differences in mitotic versus meiotic assembly. Um, in mitotic assembly, there is a pre-prophase band that exists perpendicular to uh, the spindle axis that gets formed. The pre-prophase band doesn't exist in meiosis. And so how do you orient positioning without um, a pre-prophase band is very interesting. Um, and so clearly the, some of the machinery and process is different. I have a colleague, um, uh, Carolyn Rasmussen at UC Riverside. Um, she focuses on mitotic imaging and she and I have chatted um, quite a bit about this process. Um, and so we would like to look at um, the differences here. You know, what are the players? Why is it different? Um, she focuses on Tangled um, and its involvement in um, positioning of the, uh, the spindle axis and um, positioning the new cell wall. And so we'd like to take a look at tangled in meiosis because that has not been done yet. Um, but in terms of the focusing of the poles in mitosis versus meiosis, you know, it could be simply, um, you know, my meiotically expressed kinesins that are not present in mitotic, or it could be, you know, um, you know, just differences in terms of the reality of cell volume or cell shape, um, you know, brick versus round. But um, yeah, we don't know right now. And it's something that, that I'm really interested in. Thanks. Yeah. Natalie, I have a question too, if I may. So yeah. um, uh, this is about the transition uh, of the, the uh, round uh, nuclear tubulin uh, mass or band into into the spindle. So uh, earlier in, in prop phase, like in zygotin and packetin, uh, um, there's actually quite a bit of uh, like circumnuclear uh, uh, cytoskeleton that also includes actin. So mm. is this uh, cytoskeleton reused for the spindle? And if yes, what happens to the actin? Do you know anything about that? Mm, that is a really interesting question. Um, <clears throat> I really don't mu know much about actin um, in terms of this process. Um, there, um, and Sylvester has, so there is a potential dining um, in maize that could be involved with um, uh, dining being a, a motor on actin that could be involved with pushing and pulling. And in other systems, actin often helps align the spindle in the volume. Um, there is a role for, for um, you know, nudging the spindle around using actin as well as, um, um, uh, you know, the, the astral microtubules that position outwards. So um, dynein, or sorry, yeah, I was thinking the dynein on the astral microtubules. Sorry, yeah, so um, in terms of the, the, the actin, I don't know. And it's not something I've looked into yet. Um, but certainly it could be very worthwhile given that, um, uh, you know, its presence in the cell. Um, yeah, yeah, I just haven't investigated it much. <clears throat> but, um, but the dining, um, this is what I was thinking of, the, the role of dining on astromicrotubules can, can help with positioning. Um, and so I, uh, we do have a fluorescence label dining um, that I wanna see if it's involved with, um, Astro microtubules at all. So it wasn't thought that um, <clears throat> maize meiotic spindles have very many of them. In my movies, you see these really clear points, but you don't see much splaying out from there. 
Um, but we know that there are a few of them. I do have a few movies where um, uh, there are a, it seems like a couple astro, astro microtubules and they actually kind of rotate the spindle around uh, in the cell volume. So that was kind of a surprising movie that we found as well um, because we didn't think there were very many of them, if, if any at all. So um, yeah, that's another thing I'd like to look into as well. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so if uh, that's the case, thank you, Natalie, again. Uh, it was a beautiful seminar. And thank you all for um, your attention. Um, but thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being able to, uh, to, to, to talk to you all today. Okay, great. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.